Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the uh, Justice Committee, and if you can do the needful with any electronic devices. If members are content, we'll have Hansard um, report on the oral evidence sessions today. Agreed. Um, and again, just at this stage, any um, interests that members need to declare now is the time to do it in relation to any business that we're considering. If not, then we'll proceed. We have apologies from Gemma Dolan and Emma Rogan. And, um, Sinead Bradley and Paul Frew are joining us uh, through the teleconferencing system. And at this stage, I'll ask uh, the clerk to indicate if any members have delegated authority to vote on their behalf as per the relevant standing order. Um, Chairman, uh, Gemma Dolan and Emma Rogan have delegated their votes to the Deputy Chairperson. Dylan. Okay, thank you. The draft minutes then of the meeting that was held on the 20th of May. Um, if members are content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting, then um, I can sign them accordingly. Content. Uh, matters arising. Um, the debate on the legislative consent motion on the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Bill is listed on the order paper for Tuesday, the 9th of June, with an indicative starting time of 11 a.m. Also, the uh, sorry. And now we'll move to the next item, which is the Department of Justice and Budget debate. So we'll just invite officials to come in. Um, the relevant papers, members, are pages 15 to 53 of your meeting pack, and a range of issues that members may wish to discuss with officials during the session are included in the Senior Assistance Clerk's Memo, and they'll be found on pages 15 to 18. Um, further information provided by the Department yesterday is also in the table pack of pages 3 to 16. Members can have those pages at hand. Can I welcome uh, Peter May, Permanent Secretary from the Department of Justice, and Deborah Brown, Director of Justice Delivery from the Department of Justice, and Louise Blair, uh, Financial Planning Strategy and Support Team from the Financial Services Division, uh, again from the Department of Justice, to the meeting. You're all very welcome. And uh, just advise that the meeting will be recorded by Hansard, and then the transcript will be published on the committee web page in due course. So, Peter, I'm going to hand over to you to provide an update on the department's budget and related financial issues, and then I'm sure members will have some questions. So, thank you, Peter. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chair. Can I thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on the department's finances, and in particular, uh, I want today to address concerns you and other members have raised about information shared with you and some information you feel you did not receive. I want to say at the start that uh, we very much value the role of the committee. We have no intent to hide anything or to make the task of scrutiny more difficult. In, this is a, has been a uniquely challenging period in terms of finance, as with everything else. It is normal for us to be very clear and specific on cost pressures facing the department and for you to expect nothing less. But I would ask that you recognise we cannot offer the same level of certainty as usual this year. As the Department has said, all departmental budgets are now very much in a state of flux and it will take some time for the dust to settle. In her rural session on 30 April, she acknowledged we wouldn't be bidding for additional resource if we were not able to spend the money already allocated, but also that we don't expect much would be surrendered as we already have a tight settlement prior to this crisis emerging. In the context of concerns raised by the committee, it's worth noting that since its return in February, we've engaged with the committee regularly on finance and have made ourselves available uh, whenever asked. We've responded to written questions both promptly and to the best of our ability, taking into account often challenging deadlines. I'd like to be clear and to reassure the committee in particular with regard to the, the, the areas of concern expressed, that the department is not known for setting out uh, burning platforms and has and will continue to consume its own pressures before asking for funding centrally, which we appreciate comes at an impact uh, to other public services. Let me just go into to a little more detail in a couple of areas. Firstly, in relation to what we've called other significant pressures in briefing, um, these pressures are essentially areas of risk. They are not at this point financial pressures in the current year, and on that basis, we did not put figures against these as we knew they were subject to change. Indeed, in 2019-2020, we had the same set of issues uh, and ultimately no cost crystallized in year. It's fair to say that we highlight these to the Department of Finance 
as areas which are uncertain, and if they were to crystallise, we would need assistance with them. We did not do that. If we did not do that, we would not be engaging with the Department of Finance in the right manner and in a way which would allow them to manage the block budget. We believe the Department of Finance is content with the approach we take. If you were to press me on figures today, uh, I would say that currently the range of risks for these other significant pressures for this financial year is in the region of 8 million, as we noted in our written submission to you. If you had pressed for an anticipated quantum in February, uh, the estimate would have been substantially greater. It would have been over 100 million, around 102 million. But the key point is that the number is actually somewhere between zero and, uh, the num and the cost quoted. Perhaps I should just say something about why there is uncertainty. There's two main reasons. In part, it's because of the nature of the issue. Some are subject to legal proceedings, uh, such as holiday pay. Some are subject to the passage of le legislation, such as dealing with the past. And some relate to significant cost estimates, such as the potential impact of a change to the statutory discount rate. And we do not yet know to what the rates will change. The other aspect is that we do not know, uh, in some cases, if and when the pressure uh, will actually manifest itself. In other words, at what point uh, we will actually face uh, the challenge. I hope our written briefing has provided you with further details on these issues. We'll be happy to respond to any questions you have. I'd like then to turn, if I may, to the costs of the New Decay New Approach uh, document. Uh, these were discussed at the oral session on 6 February and further detail was provided in correspondence on 18 February. The main areas which related to justice were for 7,500 officers in PS9, which was noted uh, to have an annual cost of around 40 million for 600 additional officers once all officers were recruited and fully embedded in service delivery. In addition, the Historic Investigations Unit, where costs are dependent on legislation, and the Tackling Paramilitarism Program with an estimated annual cost of £10 million, although we noted there was £18 million uh, capable of being drawn down uh, this year from the initial £50 million agreed. It was noted that work on committal reform and the Gillen sexual, Serious Sexual Offences Review implementation were at a very early stage, and significant costs were not anticipated in this year. In addition, the cost of implementing findings from Sajini reports should be prioritised within the respective organisation's operational business or form part of the Gillen costings, and we have not, therefore, included separate costings in these areas. I can provide the following update for 2020-21. We anticipate drawing down 11.6 million uh, of the money available for tackling paramilitarism. 6.5 million of this is for DOJ-related projects. We are also allocating 1.2 million to Gillen implementation. Uh, while at block level there was insufficient funding for the costs of new decay, new approach, we've sought to prioritise Gillen from the departmental budget as one of the Minister's priorities. We're also engaging with the PSNI on the development of their strategic bus outline business cases uh, for an increase in police officers, for IT and for estates. Uh, but additional funding was not provided in the budget uh, to finance additional officers, uh, although there was an increase last year, as you'll recall, uh, of 300 officers as a result of additional Brexit funding, bringing the PSI to 6,900. We don't anticipate significant other costs in relation to new decade, new approach in 2020-21. So turning then to the area of the impact of COVID-19, uh, this has been a challenging time for everyone, and what we've seen is an unprecedented need to respond across the public sector. Uh, this has created financial pressures across the executive, and some of these costs have fallen to justice. Following an early indication of COVID uh, costs, uh, DOF asked for bids by 1 April. They asked for the bids only uh, some 24 hours before that uh, in relation to additional funding needed for COVID-19. As you noted in your correspondent, the department, the, the correspondence, the department placed a bid for 38.8 million at that time, based in most cases on three months of potential interventions. Uh, this was turned around quickly to meet the urgent DOF request and didn't provide time for the usual level of scrutiny that departmental officials seek to provide uh, to ensure it's not overstating requirements. And while we reported pressures, we could not know at the time the impact that COVID-19 would have on our normal spend in terms of any easements that might uh, have come forward. As I noted earlier, the department has a consistent record of seeking to manage its own issues. 
We provided you uh, ahead of this meeting with an update of those costs, which shows uh, that we've done what we always seek to do, which is to try to manage our own finances before we ask for more. In the 10 April submission, which provided the standardised template for the forthcoming budget in 2020-21, we highlighted that we provided COVID-19 costs to DOF and received uh, 1.9 million for NIPS and 4 million for PSNI. Whilst in hindsight the table should have been shared with the committee, uh, it's also fair to say that table would have come with a range of caveats um, to explain as we did in our correspondence to you on 24 April, that it was too early to understand the impact of, COVID crisis, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis on the normal activities of the department, and therefore uh, what pressures may not be manageable by the department. The priority at that time was quite rightly to focus on the urgent response needed across the justice system to this crisis. In other words, not to delay purchasing PPE or changing work patterns because budget cover was not assured. At this point, having had the benefit of time to take stock on where we are, given the interventions that are now likely to be needed for a longer period, our gross uh, costs have increased from 38.8 million to 56 million, of which 52 million is in resource. However, there is now further clarity on areas where things have slowed down, and this has highlighted funding to offset these pressures. The main areas where we've seen a slowing of business has been in the payment of legal aid and the payment of compensation claims taking into account projected easements and the 12.4 million of funding now allocated to the, uh, uh, to the department by the executive. This leads, leaves the department with a net pressure of around 19 million pounds to, to manage. And we're engaging with our minister about what steps we might consider in relation to that. I think the papers before you identify a small easement from the June monitoring round, around 1.8 million that we would look to offset against the 19. It will be for ministers and the executive to consider in the first instance how to address these issues across the block. You'd raise, also raised concerns about a 0.9 million pound pressure relating to the LSA interim payment scheme. Uh, this was always a maximum figure and again reflects a risk rather than certain costs. And I can say more about that in questions if that is helpful. The reduction in the activity in courts that I noted earlier means there will be less legal aid spend, meaning that this pressure will no longer need uh, to uh, be met centrally. It will be managed within our existing budget, and Paul Andrews confirmed that at the committee on 23 April. In addition, it's also fair to note that the take-up of the interim scheme has been much less than expected when we introduced it, and the risk is reduced accordingly. Your pack includes a summary of the June monitoring round position. This was completed before the impact of COVID had been fully felt, but highlighted 1.9 million of resource easements and a million of capital easements. These will be used to offset the COVID pressures. The Department of Finance have indicated that EU exit pressures will be dealt with separately. Uh, I know the committee have written asking for the very detailed templates which we submit to the Department of Finance. Uh, the exercise closes tomorrow and the forms will take some time to finalise but we will plan to share these detailed forms when they're completed. As ever, when you receive them, if you have queries, we're happy to respond to them. So I'd like to close by thanking you for the opportunity to brief the committee today on the department's finances, to reiterate my reassurance to the committee that we value its role and will engage uh, with you in a full and frank way. And as ever, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, Peter, thank you um, for that. And, uh we will get into, obviously, the specific financial aspects of it. Um, to, just to address your, your opening remarks, um, which you touched on at different points throughout your contribution, um, I welcome the commitment that you've made, um, that you've no desire to hide anything from this committee. Um, I think that's something that should go without having to say it, and it's unfortunate that that's had to be said. It never should have been that case. And um, you, you mentioned that later in your contribution in respect of the templates that were provided to the Department of Finance, that it would be, I think I'm quoting, fair to say that that should have been shared with the committee uh, when it wasn't. Um, I, I want to get your, your view as to why we got information, some of it around £38.8 .8 million, pounds, not from your department, which you're the accounting officer for. The minister's not responsible for how taxpayers' money is spent. You are. Why did we have to get that from the Committee of Finance via the Department of Finance, despite having asked for it from your department? 
Um, well, it, it was an oversight. Um, it, you have to remember the context, and I tried to explain the context. We were responding uh, to multiple uh, urgent requests um, in relation to finance. There was a huge amount of other things going on at that time, as you may remember. Um, all parts of government uh, were running, uh, desperately trying to stand still. Uh, we set out to you the money that we had received from the Department of Finance. There was no attempt to, to hide. It was just a, a, a simple oversight in terms of not sharing the, uh, the information at the time. An oversight that no other department seemed to have? Uh, well, I, I can't speak for other departments, and I'm not seeking to. Um, so I'm recognising that uh, we, we should have shared that template. But um, I would also just go back and, and set it in its context. So. These were very early emerging pressures. They weren't a considered uh, position. Um, uh, and um, over time, we, we have yeah, been able to mature our view. There still remains very significant uncertainties about our budget this year in a way that's quite unique uh, in my experience in public service. So I've given you the assurance, Chair, that there was no, uh, no deliberate attempt to hide anything from this committee. That's absolutely the case. Um, there was an oversight. but. I also think um, in, in overall uh, uh, terms, you know, there was an awful lot of other things going on, and I think that a, a fair-minded person would recognise that. So in, in terms of the oversight, and you have acknowledged that it was an oversight, um, did you advise the Minister to write her letter? I'm sorry? Did you advise the Minister to write her letter that she penned to this committee? Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's never practice for officials to talk about the advice that they offer to ministers, and I'm not proposing to go down that path today. So you're, you didn't advise the minister, or you did? Uh, as I said, it's not practice for officials to disclose the advice they offer to ministers. Because the letter clearly doesn't indicate that there was anything wrong with the department's approach, in fact, categoric. And now you're saying that there was actually errors and a failure by the department in terms of what was provided to this committee. Contra um, contradicts what the minister put in her letter. I think that um, uh, we're, you know, I I've set out the position in terms of uh, a simple oversight. I think that too much uh, can be made of something like that. I know my permanent secretary would never have advised me to write the kind of letter that was written. Well, that's um, that's a matter I, I can't possibly comment on. Um, in terms of drawing a line under that issue, are we to take your response as the response from the Minister in respect of the letter that they sent to the Minister some two weeks ago? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the point you're driving at, Mr. Well, Chair. Well, the Minister hasn't responded. The, the Committee responded to the Minister. I understand that the, letter, the, the, the Minister did write to, to you and set out um, uh, the position and offered that officials were coming today clarify the issues. Okay, well, I think she then went on to say that insofar as uh, there remained further issues to be explored, she would be happy to engage with the committee if that was necessary. I, I don't have a copy of the letter in front of me, but I'm, okay, I'm I'll get perhaps the, the clerk can clarify whether I'll a letter, get the letter. Was received. Okay, I'll get the letter and I'll come back to you on it. Okay, in terms of the, the information that we have, net pressure of 19 million for the remainder of the financial year, is that the figure that I picked out in your contribution? Um, yeah, as I said, we've, we've identified 1.8 million of easements from June monitoring, which you would net off against those COVID pressures, so that'd be about 17 million is the current situation. Um, there are lots, still lots of moving parts, and I want to stress that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an estimate at this stage. And in terms of the engagement with the minister then as to how you're going to manage that pressure, um, obviously there's a range of areas here that you know, members may want to, to pick up on, but in terms of that net pressure, obviously something's going to have to give, um, and uh, we would like to know what are the areas that are being considered that will no longer be taken forward. Yeah, well, in, in that uh, uh, connection, so there may be um, the exercise we're currently completing with the Department of Finance uh, involves setting out what the pressures are for all departments so that there can be a, an executive-wide view taken as to the nature of those pressures. Um, we need to continue to bear down on our costs in all areas. Um, we have some further uh, pressures in relation to PPE, and there is a central fund for PPE held by the executive, so um, you know, we would hope that that might be something that uh, was, was possible, might find favour. It's a, uh, an estimate at the moment of around uh, £5 million. Pounds. 
And then, as you said, we will explore with the Minister and the Minister with the Executive uh, what possibilities there are beyond that. Okay, I'm going to bring in other members just to, to get round some of these issues. Linda? To be fair, actually, you've, you've asked the, the question, um, Chair, around the, you know, how we're going to find the money, I suppose, in, in terms of the pressures. And, and I had noticed that the £5 million that does obviously leave them a gap of, of £12 million. So I might understand then, whenever all of this information has been given to the Department of Finance, they will look at, right across the board, all of the different departments, and as an, as an executive, look at where the Department of Finance can help you, and then where you will have to look for. You don't know, actually, at this minute, what you'll have to find within your own department. Is that right? That's, that's fair. I think the other thing to, to draw out is that this may not, in all cases, be cuts. It may well be that there are further savings that emerge. So people have to make assumptions about um, particularly uh, demand-led spend. So let's take legal aid as a classic example. There's a large amount of money each year for legal aid. We found an easement already because we've made a projection. But it's really hard to be sure how quickly court business will return to the previous levels. Um, so with the benefit of another month or two, we will have a better sense and we'll continue to, to, to look at that. So those are the sorts of areas. There is some scope. Um, you'll recall probably from previous briefing that I think it's 68% of our budget is spent on, on um, staff resourcing. Um, those, those sorts of funds are continuing and we are continuing, for example, to pay uh, uh, for some services that we may not be receiving directly. So we are, for example, continuing to meet the, um, the terms of payments to the third sector. Uh, for contracts that we would have. Uh, some of them might be, for, for example, provided in a prison context, but because prisons are not allowing people out from outside to visit at the moment, they're not able to deliver those services. But if, if we ceased paying, then there obviously there'd be a risk that, that that provider wouldn't be there at the time that we needed them in future. So in line with the approach taken across government, we've sought to continue to make those payments. So I'm just trying to give you some sense of the sort of moving, what does move and what doesn't move in the terms of our budget. Chair, can I just two small queries out, out of the response there. So, First of all, in relation to the legal aid, and, and you've highlighted in your paper, so you're aware of it, obviously more people are going to be on are, are on benefits, we know that already, and probably many more into the future in, in realistic terms, yeah. around redundancy, potential redundancies. So the legal aid bill could very quickly go back up again. We could, we could have additional pressure rather than easement. So that's something... I suppose it's just really in terms of, and, and the chair obviously had the, the conversation with you about us needing the information. If we can get that kind of information as quickly as possible in terms of whenever you are aware of it, so that we know when to question how is this going to be yeah. managed, rather than waiting until we have to get it. And, and that's to help us all. That's to help the, the committee and, and to help the department, because we want to be helpful in terms of, of, of all of this stuff, stuff going forward. The, the third sector stuff, are you talking about, is it around training, education for prisoners or for prison officers? What, what are we talking about in relation, just an example, there's, I'm not asking you to detail everything. There's a everything. wide range of third sector organisations that operate uh, in, our, in our prison service. Most of them would be in prisoner facing uh, roles, so uh, working in terms of uh, providing support to them, whether it be in preparation for them uh, being released or whatever it might be. So and I I, I, we can provide a, uh, some further information if that's useful to, to you. Um, on, your, on your first point, we're very happy to share with you um, information and also to share the assumptions we have made that justify that information. Um, I think what I'm asking is that the committee uh, gives us some leeway to recognise that some of the assumptions we make may not turn out to be right because the nature of the world that we're in is such that, that things are not as predictable as they would normally be. And just the, the last thing in relation to the third sector. So obviously, I mean, people aren't going into the prison and that has worked very effectively and it has kept the, the prisoners and the staff um, for the most part safe and, and COVID free and we're, we're glad to see that. But is there, in terms of going forward, you know, even if it means they can't come into the prison, I think if they're being paid, we need to ensure that there's some work going on there, that they're doing what they can, rather than just, it's not happening, we can't do it. There has to be ways looked at around how, how can some of that stuff continue to be delivered, how can some of those services continue to be delivered. I think it's important that, that we are 
you know, pushing in relation to as much of that work that can be done, whether it's virtually or, or whatever way it can be managed. And I know some of it will just not be able to accept that. But it, I think it's important that there, a close eye is kept on that because it could be very easy to, you know, be so busy looking at everything in terms of the big picture that we forget about the small stuff that's really important. So I think that's absolutely right. We need to march in tune with the executive's um, uh, pathway to recovery and what they indicate is permitted at any given point. Uh, but within that context, absolutely, we do look to uh, maximise what can be done. And, um, you know, uh, while it's not directly the third sector, you'll know, for example, that the introduction of virtual visits is one of the ways in which the prison service has looked to adapt its normal working uh, practices in order to recognise that. But yes, you're absolutely right that we should look to get the best value that we possibly can from uh, all of the money that we are spending. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Linda. Doug? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Peter, thank you for, for, um, for, your, for your presentation. I mean, when you put something like this here, it, it always allows people to get into the weeds of, of, of the budget. And, and, and I don't want to get in too much into the weeds, but there are certain things I'd just like to, I'd like to know. I mean, I'm always interested in legal aid and our legal services and the bill that yeah. goes towards it and, and I've raised this with you before because I'm concerned about that fraud and error piece and then, you know that's always her but could you give us a sense um, just a broad brush a sense of, of the overspend in the non ring fence Dell for legal aid services at 600k and, and a sense of the underspend of the non ring fence Dell okay so sorry um, if I could just maybe pick that one up if that's Please. okay um, so um, Towards the end of the financial year, we became aware that we had some easements in the system, and so well, obviously what we do is we look around to see if anyone can, you know, spend some more money. So legal aid was one of those areas. So whilst it's shown as an overspend of six hundred thousand, it's not actually an overspend. It is. It can be managed within the department's budget. It was done in the knowledge that it could be spent. And what we do um, as part of the accounts, and we look and we look for veerment, and we know that we'll get the veerment because it's below the demand rule of the million pounds. So that was a that was a conscious decision to get more legal aid out. And what that does, obviously, is reduces the amount of legal aid that you pay out in the, in the current financial year. So that was a that was a good piece of financial management. The other element is the one which is um, in our in our AMI, and this is where something moved from Dale, which is your budget that you manage, into your AMI. So that's how that underspend actually happened. As, as shown as an overspend, but it's actually an underspend. So it was an overspend in Dale, but it wasn't actually because it was managed within the budget and was deliberately done so to mop up some easements that we had. And the other one was a technical issue where something was moved from being treated as Dale into AMI. So I hope that provides you with a little well, bit of Well, it does, Deborah, actually. And what you're talking about is internal financial management. Absolutely. Yes. And, and that is saying, look, you had this budget, but we've got this bit extra. We're going to yes. give it to you. So it looked like it. OK, that makes, that makes perfect sense. So, so, so thanks for that. Um, can, can I just go on then to the, the tackling of paramilitarism? Uh, and you're going to try and draw down the 6.5 million in regards to that tackling of paramilitarism. Um, I'm, 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 whenever we didn't have an executive, strangely enough, in an assembly, we used to get quarterly briefings on where we were in regards to the tackling paramilitary programmes and we don't seem to be getting it. Where are we now in regards to that? So um, uh, at the moment we are doing some work looking at the next three years. So the programme, as you know, ends in March 2021. Um, new Decade, New Approach indicated support for a, a further programme. So work is going on which we hope to take to the executive in the next couple of months. So, um, inevitably, in the past, there was an all-party briefing. Yeah. Um, that reflected the fact there wasn't an executive. Now there's an executive. That would be the, the normal first port of call to take, you know, because we need absolutely need cross executive. It's not purely a Department of Justice uh, enterprise. This has to be something with all departments working together. So we would plan to take the proposition around phase two that's been worked on by the team and engaging uh, officials in all departments uh, to the executive and would be happy to provide a briefing to the committee thereafter. And I, th and I think that would be really useful, um, Peter and Chair. I mean, it would be really good to, to know where we were in regards, regards to that. Two, two very quick ones, if I can, please. Um, one, COVID-19, um, the resting facility, 1.9 million to create that. I don't think anybody's going to argue about the reason that we created the resting facility, and, and it was right and proper to do that, um, uh, <laughs> which is good. But can I ask then, what is the predicted cost of that facility in the next two to three years if we maintain it, or what are we intending to do with it? Is there, is there been any prediction on, on what the costs are going to be in the years to come? Um, there, there aren't at the moment uh, projected costs going forward. Um, we obviously have to make a decision about what the future for the resting place is. 
and that's something that we're beginning to turn our minds to now. It was a huge effort to get it set up. Uh, thankfully, it's not been needed uh, yet, and we hope it will continue not to be needed. Uh, but we will be um, taking, uh, consider, considering the options there, and again, we'd be happy to explain to the committee where we've got to in due course. Is, it, is that likely to happen soon, Peter? Is it, I mean, is that decision going to be made soon, or, or what, what's um, the timeline for that decision? I think that it would be likely to be made by sort of September. Um, uh, I think our current arrangement with uh, the lease of the land from the Ministry of Defence runs out in September, so we would need to be clarifying our position by then. Okay, and, and, and fair one. Um, and the last one, just on the, the new decade, new approach. Um, we talked about the increase of the PSNI. Um, but there was no monies um, allocated for that increase in, in PSNI numbers up uh, up to um, 7,500. Um, is there going to be any in internal monies put aside to allow the, the police service to move in regards to that, or are we stuck because there's no money for it to happen? Well, the, the, the PSNI receive a budget. The Chief Constable is yeah. the sub-accounting officer for that budget, and obviously he gets to make some decisions as to how he spends that money. Um, what we're doing at the moment is working on the longer term, the business case, both for the increase in officers, for the proposals in relation to IT, which is another key part of the transformation, and the third area to do with the states. And that would provide the long-term vision as to where um, the PSNI want to go, but it would then uh, be obviously be endorsed by the department and ultimately by the Department of Finance. Um, I want to recognise that the policing board has a critical role to play in all of that, and certainly they would suggest that... Uh, the department gets in the way of that important uh, scrutiny and function that the board plays. Um, so the answer to your question is that at this stage, um, we have not provided extra money for the purposes of additional police officers. Um, given the pressures we're facing at the moment, um, that it doesn't look likely we will be able to provide additional money. The chief constable obviously can consider within his own budget as to how he manages things. But one of the things that does need to be taken into account is if you employ officers the cost in year one is less than in subsequent years, and you do need to have confidence that you'll have the money in future years in order to make that commitment in year one. And, and, and Peter, do you have confidence that we will get to a place where we will be able to increase that as per uh, the new decade, new approach? Do you think we will? Or do you think actually it's too big an ask and the money's not there, the resource isn't there? And I know, you, I mean, you don't have to answer that, but it's just a th I'm trying to give you a uh, thought process. It's very it. hard to have uh, confidence in a future budget that we haven't seen, given what's happened to public finances um, in all uh, nations yeah. in recent uh, weeks and months. So I, I think at the moment I, I can't give you that answer. I think certainly getting to 7,500 by the end of this mandate is unlikely, in my view, uh, because of the sheer scale. Um, there's, a, there's actually a limiting factor as to how many the PSNI could recruit, even if they had the money. So. Um, I think we should be realistic about the speed of progress, uh, even if there's an aspiration to increase the size of the PSNI. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dick. Um, Rachel. Thank you. Um, I, this is the first time I've ever done budgeting. I'm only a relatively new member, and certainly the um, first time I've had a look at June monitoring rounds. So I actually have two pages of questions, but I'm not going to go over them. <laughs> um, <laughs> today, but there's a number of things that Doug has touched upon, um, and I'll start with the Kinniger base. Um, the Minister had stated to the committee that she would be minded to keep that facility, um, and I had written to her about that because um, I'm sure you're aware that the, the base is actually up for sale in 2022. Um, I'd been directed towards the Ministry of Defence and an MP um, in procurement about this, but I'm wondering is the part of the discussions with the rete possible retention of the Kinniger base, has that any effect on the potential sale? And has there been any conversations with the Ministry of Defence about that? Uh, we haven't got to the point where we've opened any formal conversations um, at a senior level with the Ministry of Defence about these issues. Um, so, as I said, we're still looking at the options that are available to us. Um, and, and there are a range of different ways in which we could choose to go forward. Okay, and no, we're just minded that as a, an ex um, councillor for Arts and North Downbar Council, that there was a, a, a motion had been passed on the council when I was there about looking at the council potentially acquiring the site, and, and it, certainly there would be a number of different players involved in that. So, it's our, would welcome uh, information if that has been discussed, and that the council would definitely need to be involved in that, okay. um, given the relationship that is already there with them. With regard to the costs. Um, the 1.9 million for the resting place is that that's already committed, 
Or is so, there is there more costs coming down the line uh, again further on from Doug? Is that for the, the the lease, or is that to pay for security or extra staffing costs or that kind of thing? So. I'm going to turn to my, my right for the detailed figures, yeah. but there so are costs in both resource there are and costs in capital. In resource and in capital. So there was 1.6 million, which was the, the resource costs associated with it, um, and some of that was also to give some money to councils to compensate them for things that they would have to do within that. Um, and you'll notice in the paper that we have highlighted that actually it's about 750 of that that we will now be giving back, um, and because it's 1.6 was given for those specific purposes, that will be given back. Um, then on the capital side, um, it's about four million of capital. But you'll also notice um, from the COVID paper um, that the capital table shows that we have easements coming out as a result of COVID from other areas such as courts. And so therefore that leaves us with sort of a residual pressure at the moment potentially in capital of about 1.6 million. And given the size of our capital budget and given the current situation that we're in, um, we don't think there's a need to bid for that yet. Um, we need to look at what's happening on the other capital projects across the board. That is being looked at in detail. We're not anticipating giving back any capital um, in June monitoring at this stage because we're still um, investigating what the impact of COVID is having on a delivery of a lot of those large capital projects. And we have been engaging with our partners who are, have those large capital projects. And the um, advice that we're being given at the moment is that they have some smaller projects that they can bring forward. And in other areas, their capital profile um, is, is back-ended. And so therefore, they hadn't anticipated um, very few costs in the first few um, months of the year. OK, thank you. Um, in terms of the EU scoping exercise on costs for Brexit, has that started? Um, I know it was brought up in this committee a number of months ago. Um, and is there sort of a terms of reference? When will that be reported on? Is there kind of a date in which the department has to report, say, to the minister on the executive on? That's been decided. OK, thank you. Um, in relation to Brexit, uh, we received £10 million last year, the vast majority of which went towards the 300 extra police officers that I described earlier. Uh, we know that there is definitely a need for an additional five million this year, and that's that very much to meet the point I was trying to make to Doug earlier. So, you, you employ, you start employing people uh, at each stage during the 12 months of the year. The next year, you have to pay them for the whole 12 months. So that's why it's uh, an extra five million. Um, what we don't yet have any um, uh, ad additional certainty or clarity on is whether there will be additional costs as a result of the uh, protocol and the transition. Um, and there is no, you know, there's ongoing work being done. Obviously, the uh, UK government recently issued a paper in relation to those issues. We're working through what that might mean. But I suspect we have not, I suppose it's probably fair to say at the moment we've not identified additional costs that flow from that. But it's something that we're keeping under close review as we understand how uh, those policies will be operationalised. Okay, but and just to, just to sort of tease that out further, is there a, would there be an expectancy that there would be a report drawn up from a, for, by a certain point of the remainder of this year? Obviously, we are due to um, the transition period is due to end on 31st of December this year. So, would, is there a plan from the department to submit a, a report on expected costs by a certain stage, or is it a case of identifying them at you know as and when? Well, as I said, we've already we don't, we're not going to issue a report, but we have already clarified the need for the five million as a carry forward from last year and um, what we're doing is we're keeping under review whether there are any additional costs that will flow but we have not yet identified any but there won't be any formal report about that okay no problem um the minister had suggested yesterday that she would be willing to have the victims payment schemes within the department of justice so i'm wondering if there's been a costings estimate exercise done on that possible proposal so <clears throat> to be just to clarify that the Minister has been very clear that she doesn't believe the Department of Justice is the best department to run this scheme, uh, but that if she was asked to run it by uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, uh, then the department would take that role forward. But it is her view, I think, I'm not misquoting her, that the Department for Communities is the more natural home because they're used to paying pension payments. I think that uh, we're all very interested in the likely cost, um, and I turn again to Deborah in a moment, but, but I don't believe that we do have sufficient clarity yet because there are a range of 
uh, decisions that need to be taken about the nature of the scheme and so on. And it may well be even when the scheme is being set up because of the nature of the decision making that will uh, apply as to it'll be a judicial based uh, decision making scheme. Um, that it will be difficult to have any clarity about what the, uh, the... You may well be in a business of having a range rather than having a total and individual cost, uh, I suspect. Is there anything you'd like to add? I would just to add that, you know, TEO have been doing a lot of work on that, um, and indeed um, our compensation service have been assisting them with some of their modelling, etc., on this and helping them. But there is a great... Um, uncertainty, as Peter says, around you know, the costings. There have been some figures out in the media around three-year costs, etc. But all of that is subject to further scrutiny and what actually is in the legislation, etc. So. Thank you. And I appreciate that. appreciate it's a very difficult situation here in terms of where it's going to land. Um, my last question then is also on the tackling paramilitaries and money. I would certainly second the a, a more regular update. Um, I appreciate it may go to the executive, but as a non-executive party, um, I'm one that is quite keenly interested in this part um, of the Justice Department. I would appreciate a, a committee uh, update on where we're at with that. Um, just to confirm that it was six million was going to be drawn down from the possible 18 to 19 million for this year. So I think it's, a, it's 11, maybe 11 and a 11. half that is uh, being drawn down overall. But six and a half of that would be spent by the Department of Justice. Okay. Um, most of that um, is spent in either the Parliamentary Crime Task Force by the PSNI, or uh, there's a small team that coordinates the work that the department hosts. Um, so those are the two main costs that, that flow from that uh, six and a half million. Okay, um, that's that's fine. That's the going to ask for a breakdown of what that comes for. So we can, I mean, obviously, in due course, we can give you more information, and and if. Um, you would find it useful, it's obviously, uh, if this is permitted, to have a separate conversation about budgeting. We're happy to, because of your, you know, you're, you're being new to the area, then I don't see any difficulty with that. Thank you very much. Just a couple of members wanted to pick up on a little bit of Rachel's. It was Linda and Doug, and then I want to pick up on that as well. So, Linda. Just a very quick question, just on the stuff Rachel raised around the, the victims' pensions. Um, is the Minister, has she indicated that she's prepared to take that without being assured around uh, financial no. assistance from... No. So, sorry, <coughs> not only was she saying that, uh, in her view, it belonged with another department, but she's also been very clear that there would need to be um, an absolute guarantee that the department would be funded for any costs, both costs of paying the pension and any costs of administering the scheme as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick one. Um, Peter, if I can, you talked about the 6.5 million for, for paramilitarism, and a lot of that's going to um, the PSNI for, for the, the paramilitary crime task force fight. It's not just the PSNI; I should say NCA and HMRC. Well, that was the question. That, that was the question I was going to ask, uh, and some of that is going to the, the National Crime Agency as well yeah. for the same it's, reason. It's, it's for, sorry, I used a shorthand. But I know you did. I was, and I, I, I was just just confirming. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. And just on the, the victim's pension, uh, the, the current position that the Minister has indicated that you've outlined a willingness to take it on um, subject to, has that always been the case? Um, no. Um, uh, this is something that she wrote in recent weeks to uh, our First Minister, Deputy First Minister. Is that the first time she's written? I. I don't know. I'd need to go and review whether there are any uh, previous correspondence or not. How long has the dialogue been going on between the Minister for Justice and TEO in respect of this issue? Well, it certainly it predates the Minister of Justice, and this is an issue that was being discussed um, uh, prior Absolutely. to the return of the Assembly and the Executive as yes. to what, what shape and form and who might administer yeah. the scheme. We've been engaging with with TEO since sort of October time, just because they've been looking at the compensation service system to see if that would be something that could be used and also using some of the modelling that they use. So we've been engaged with them since that point. So the, the, the current position which the Minister has outlined to TEO, which you've articulated that she is willing to take it on, um, subject to it all being well, financed. it wouldn't be her preference. Yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be her preference. So that, that position. Was there previous correspondence that didn't have that kind of caveat associated with it, or has there been other positions outlined which is contrary to the current one? Um, I, as I said, I can't recall about whether there's, uh, I need to go back and review previous correspondence. Certainly, um, you know, our starting point um, was that you know, we didn't think the Department of Justice was the most appropriate uh, place for this. Um, but you know, that's uh, uh, so. That I, I, you know, uh, there was a 
there has been quite protracted conversations. I, I can't recall the extent to which there's been any ministerial correspondence about it. Well, I think it would be useful for the committee to get sight of the correspondence and exchanges between the Department of Justice and TEO in respect of this issue, um, because it's one that has went on for months, incredibly unseemly in terms of the issue that we're talking about, and I think it would be important that we start to get the backstory in respect of how this issue is being managed within the departments here. So uh, if that information can be provided in terms of the correspondence um, between this department and the TEO, I think that would be useful that uh, members may be interested to see some of that. Okay, that's fine. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation this morning. Um, the, the advance on legal services was something that was done here some weeks ago. Yes. I understand it, the budget was exceeded in relation to that. My understanding, Chair, was it was come in uh, within existing funding. Is that the case, that it has exceeded what was planned? Um, <clears throat> short answer to that is no. Um, the, um, the plan had been to... Um, well, we, we, we started an interim payment scheme, which is a way of paying people for work they have already done. As part well, of also that. work that was planned to be done. No, no, we, we're not paying in advance. We're paying an interim payment, in other words, a payment before the case is complete for work that has already been completed and can be evidenced. So the vast majority of the payments we're making, well, all the payments we're making are for work that's been done. The reason that the 0.9 million came about was we identified a risk the risk is that a solicitor or a barrister might cease to trade before the case is completed, at which point a new solicitor or barrister would need to be brought into the case and would need to redo some of that work. And we made what was our best estimate mm -hmm. that that might be a total of 0.9 million at one point in time. Um, that was, in my view, always you know, a relatively um, generous estimate as to what would be likely. But in practice, the take-up of the scheme has been much less than we expected. And because we've not been paying out anything like the volume, then we, that may be partly because some solicitors have their staff furloughed. So because they're furloughed, they're not able to do any work. They're not able, therefore, to make uh, claims. I don't know. I'm, I'm slightly guessing, but that's, that's one of the possible explanations. Um, but because we're paying out so much less, um, actually, the, the risk is, is much less than uh, 0.9 million now. And in any case, because the legal aid payments overall have reduced, we would be able to find any additional, uh, small additional costs that would be um, uh, as a result of that. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, so it, you're, you're saying that it did come in within budget or below budget? It will come in within budget. Well, well if you look at the, at the table, you'll see that um, in, uh, on the legal aid side, um, we are giving up easements as a consequence of COVID um, of 15 million. But you have some small pressures, you know, that, that we're, we're reporting the cost yeah. of COVID. Yeah. So at the moment, there's about half a billion there um, around IT costs and other things that um, LSA have had to do. But within that, then there's the element which is to do with this risk that we might have to pay for business again because some solicitors, etc., have folded. And the estimate at the minute is sitting now at around about 330,000. And I would suggest that probably will come down lower because you know, we're obviously reassessing this as we become familiar with it. I mean, even just to give you a flavour. Um, of, of the uptake um, on the interim payment scheme. Um, I mean, we only got 1,642 requests from 99 legal service suppliers, um, and so therefore we've only paid out about £492,000 at this stage, which is way lower you know, than the, sort of the £16 million that we had you know, estimated over like that three to six months period. So within that short period of time, there's limited uptake. There's still, still quite a long time to go, or it could be. Yes. It yeah. could yet grow, but um, I think our expectation had been that if firms were in financial distress, they would have, or barristers as sole traders, that they would have made the, the request early and quickly. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's possible that we'll see yeah. an increase, but it's not certain, I think. The other thing, um, under the COVID-9, you have put in here 12.4 uh, resource dale, 12.4 million resource as part of the June monitoring round. Um, three uh, sorry, 4.9 goes towards PPE across the justice sector. Yeah. Is that within a new financial year or is that? That's in this financial year. 
Yeah. That's, that's in addition to what we've already received from the executive for PPE. So 4.9 million uh, towards, that's just for the justice sector? Yeah. So that would cover up particularly police and prisons would be the main yeah. users? Police got 4 million of that, um, prisons I think got about 500 and FISNY got another 100 I think. From my recollection. Yeah, but that, so yeah, it's yes, four four million for PSNI to maintain critical services. Could you clarify? Is that PP as well? No, no, no. That's that's. What is that? That's the consequences of what COVID has had on their operations that they've had to maintain um, their critical services over this period. But this, that money is not part of the costings dated back to the start of this in say February. Um, it I would wouldn't say they were planning probably in February for this. In, in, in February, uh, we would not have been able to put any run of figures against COVID pressures. So it, it would have featured in the uh, early April uh, first set of numbers, the, the 38.8 million that we've talked about. Um, but, but inevitably, as I said before, the numbers are continually being refined as we understand better uh, what the impact really is. We have a, you know, a breakdown net of 1.9 for the prison service to maintain frontline services. Is that again PPE? No, that's, there are, um, the Department of Finance agreed to a proposal um, which is the same as, as has happened in prisons in uh, England and Wales that prison officers would secure, would have additional, some additional allowances uh, in recognition of the difficult environment that they're working in at the moment and, and uh, the uh, risk of being in contact with those with, um, with COVID-19 and so on. So are the prison officers getting that at the moment? Yes. They are. When did that come into being? When did that um, start being paid? Uh, the precise date, um, I'd need to check, but I think it would have been April, yeah. um, uh, okay, is, my, uh, is my view. So we have secured some funding from April to June already from the executive, and the additional um, re resource that we put in would see that going beyond because of the un continued uncertainty. Okay, but I think so. Just to clarify, then, which is it's a very topical issue, then the prison officers are getting an additional allowance for working during the COVID crisis. Um, yes, in different respects. So that some is in relation to overtime payments, some is in relation to particular payments for those who work in isolation units where they're in full PPE. Okay, thanks. The so the four million pounds for the PSNI. Um, is not PPE. Do we know the actual cost of PPE then across the sector? Uh, it's, it's we, the start we of can this provide it um, probably be better if we, if we write to you and make sure we've got all of the, well, the figures. So we have already have, secured some yeah. funding for PPE. So uh, our estimate of PPE requirement across the, the department um, uh, and its armed strength bodies, including the police, um, is, is about 10 million, of which we've received 4.9 million to date. Um, that leaves potentially another five million, but of course that is PPE being required for probably the full financial year, and we'll have to keep reassessing that as we see the, the situation um, unfold. So well, that's yeah, the financial year we're now in. Yes. So the actual cost to date, just clarify that again. Well, I c couldn't tell you the cost to date. Okay, is the, the cost projected for the year are about ten million, of which we've received four point nine. Um, I know that the police have, have spent, I think, two and a half already, maybe on PPE, but obviously that's, they've obviously got to cover the coming months and then to look into the future. So with five million that's still not covered, but obviously we'll need to assess the need for that as we go through the, the current crisis um, and keep revisiting it. And if we need to, we will bid for it. OK, John. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Gordon. And um, Paul Frey. Yes, thank you, Chair. And, uh, that, that's... That this session is sort of cut out on me in, in small periods uh, and not only so uh, apologize if I ask something that's maybe already been covered extensively but uh, Peter first of all let me thank you for your candor here today and your information that you and your team have brought to this committee it's very very good and it, it, it contrasts greatly from the, the, the information that the Department of Finance gave to the Finance Committee yesterday which was zero on June monitoring so I thank you for that. Let me get the nasty stuff out of the way first. Uh, you know, we don't mind the minister being robust, uh, but a robust relationship works both ways. So we will be very robust, and you know we can be very robust. So that's, if that's the movement forward, so be it. Uh, and we'll accept that. Uh, 
and move on and not vegan. But can I just say that the relationship I've had with you and your team has been a very good one, uh, even throughout the lean periods over the last number of years. And I've always uh, respected you and valued the contact that you've always had with me and all the other parties uh, and treated us all very fairly and kept us informed. Uh, can I ask, what, and, and I take your point about uh, the oversight, and, and you know, in the fog of, of ISIS, there will be oversight, there will be mistakes, uh, and that's a natural thing. And so we just have to get understanding of it and learn from things and make sure they don't happen again in the future. And that's all good, proactive planning uh, for the next time. So I have no problems with that. I will not be critical of a department if they make mistakes uh, in this regard and and can be accounted for and can be explained. Um, Can I ask with regards to the information that you would supply to the committee normally and the information then you supply to the Department of Finance through the budgetary systems, has there been in the past a difference? Peter, you picked that up. Yep. Um, I, I suspect that we would provide the committee normally with a summary of the material that yeah. goes to the Department of Finance. Uh, absolutely, and, and that would be my experience of, of, of other committees. Is it, is it a summary of, of what we have done and the key um, material elements? There are an awful lot of really detailed um, internal sort of small moves that, that happen um, around from things like technical adjustments, the um, money's being moved to other departments for certain things, and they all appear in all of those very detailed templates. So we wouldn't have given the committee those sorts of things in the past, and it would be my experience that I haven't given that to other committees in the past because it's very detailed. What we make sure we do is we give you the key issues around the key pressures, where the easements are, and how we might reallocate to manage that or to bid, as the case may be. Um, so I don't know if that helps, um, but yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, so that would be the, the reason. The reason of being is that, is that it's too technical or just too much information. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not being critical on that point because you could flood it. You know, you could flood a committee with information to the point where the committee members could miss critical points. Um, so, so you know, that that could be a strategy going forward some departments might have deployed in the past. But what I suppose I'm getting at is that, see, see the, the, on page 38 of our pack, and it's your uh, submission to DOF as early estimates, there, there within that table, there are a lot of to be confirmed, TBCs. Is that the raw material that was sent to the Department of Finance? Now, I know these are early estimates, but it, it, have, have the Department of Finance received that chart with those TP, TBCs on it also? Yes, that's yes, correct. Yes, I'm, I'm confident that is yep. correct, Paul. Um, we wouldn't have provided um, figures to the Department of Finance and not to yourselves. Yes, okay. That, 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 was, that was my concern. Um, and so, so you can see how at early estimate stage, you're having to put down on chart something that you aren't sure of. Uh, and I, I get that, and I understand that, and that matures as we go along the budget process. You have been asked to do something different, uh, and apart from doing, although I can't understand why doing monitoring or any monitoring round isn't a prioritisation plan anyway, but you're now told to do a reprioritisation plan alongside your doing monitoring. What has that meant for the department in, in difference of activity? Well, I think, I mean, to be fair, we had already identified the need to do an exercise like that and had actually set one off ourselves before the Department of Finance came out uh, because we knew that this year there were such high levels of uncertainty around our budget spend that we needed to be, um, you know, uh, doing more than we would normally. <coughs> you couldn't assume that the budget that had been allocated was the right budget, either plus or minus. Um, so what it takes is it takes each business, uh, each budget holder, uh, to do a, a proper uh, look at their, um, their anticipated spend. I'm being open with the committee that we're still working on a basis of assumptions here, um, and those, some of those assumptions may or may not turn out to be correct. 
Um, but that's the basis on which we've, we've looked at the, the, the work. Okay. Um, c can I ask, within that three prioritisation plan, as opposed to a June monitoring round, you, you've, been given, you've been given further parameters to work. Is that, is that right? So what the Department of Finance has asked us to do is to uh, identify the, um, the pressures that departments face and then um, you know, what are the um, options that are going to be available uh, in terms of how best to meet that. Maybe just to say that there's additional flexibility being provided in this monitoring yeah. round, which means we can move money around very freely, whereas in a normal monitoring round there would be restrictions, things like the demineral of, of the million pounds, etc. So, um, as, as we have presented to you, you know, the pressures and the easements, we're now going to have to match some of those easements and say where they're going to go against some of those pressures. And I would have to say that that's a very big challenge whenever we don't really know of all of those pressures, which one of those are going to materialise. And we could risk matching an easement against a pressure and that pressure then not materialising and having money stuck in the wrong place and not being able to move it back. So we would like to think that come October monitoring round, we might get the same flexibility again. So I think it should be recognised that this is a very complex and very difficult thing to do at this stage with the level of uncertainty that we have around some of those pressures and the assumptions that we have made around those pressures and what may happen in the future, because we are dealing with a complete unknown here. There is no precedent here. There is no, no baseline to look at. You know, so this is very, very difficult, and it could present pr um, problems in the future if we put budget in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah I, you preempted my next question with regards to I think that we'll need reprioritisation plans if that's what they're going to be called here on in, in, in on each monitoring stage. Uh, I, I you know maybe 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 that additional flexibility is, is maybe what's needed throughout the monitoring round system uh, to allow greater agility and flexibility with regards to departments and within departments. Um, Do you agree with that? I think that certainly for this year, there's a case for it because of the levels of uncertainty. Um, in, in other years, um, where times are more normal, then it may well make more sense for the executive to be able to look right across all departments as to where any easements should go. Okay. With regards to some of the detail now, uh, in paragraph 9, it stated that funding of uh, 1.1 million, I think that is, has been recommended to take forward a gallon review implementation. Yep. Uh, will, will that 1.1 be a bid from the centre, or, or will that be so, moved around within the department? So, um, no funding was provided for new decade, new approach uh, <coughs> requirements this year, of which Gillen is one. But, uh, the minister, because it's a key priority for the minister, we have reallocated, reapportioned re re money within the department to meet that need. So where, where did that money come from then? What part? Um, so we had, in our opening allocations, we had um, identified a need for Gill and, and had set aside 2.4 million. Now that more work has been done in scoping that, the requirement is just 1.2 million, so the remainder and finds its way into that easement that we're reporting as part of June monitoring round of the 1.8. Okay, I see that. Yep. Okay. So, uh, just, just final point then on on the actual concerns that we had uh, that were raised in the uh, assembly chamber by the chair and by myself and has been picked up ably by the chair of the finance committee now uh, with regards to the three uh, 38.8 million. Now, I get the 1.9 million for the pressure and the risk, um, but, but I think it would be good in the future that we are seeing, we get to see all numbers, figures, and, and a portion beside that, whether it's a real or a risk or a forecasted risk. Um, and you know something, the next time you're up a month and a month, you know, a month later, if you're now able to evolve that or, or amend that, so be it. But but that will come with an explanation if we need one. And, and that way, moving forward, we will have much detail as we can probably take in. And, and if we have any concerns with the committee, we, we can then raise them in a sensible manner with you and hear a very valid explanation from you on that. Um, it, it's what, what annoys me, and, and what has annoyed me since I have come back, 
uh, I, I'm, I'm sick and to death already uh, with, with uh, information not flowing to committees, not just the justice, but finance, which I'm on. And I'm, on, I'm only back a couple of months, uh, and I see no change uh, whatsoever from the old ways, and that can't exist. Uh, it won't exist. It just can't. So, so that 38.8 million, where you talked about other places, uh, surely it, it would have been better to itemise that down into risks, into real pressure, into forecasted pressure, um, and give it to the committee. And then, because you've given it to the Department of Finance, and then evolve it, revolve it, come back to us when it becomes much clearer. So just to be clear, I think there's two different uh, sets of numbers here. So the 38.8 was related specifically to COVID pressures. Yes. Um, and there was a level of, I accept there's a level of uncertainty, but they were all things that uh, you know, we thought would exist. Um, the other significant pressures, uh, which is the other group that we didn't provide information on, um, that was because there was really high levels of risk. I've explained at one point a couple of months ago it might have been over 100 million. We're now at 8 million. So that's a big sort of set of moving numbers. Um, I don't have a problem providing an overall figure, but I, I would ask the committee to reflect on whether it is sensible for us to provide numbers in relation, for example, to court cases. You wouldn't normally divulge in public what your exposure might be in result uh, if a court case went against you in advance. The reality is, as I said, that the court case has been contested anyway, so it's somewhere between naught and a large number, but the court could decide on all sorts of bases as to how uh, to, to allocate, uh, uh, to, to reach its decision if it did find against the department. Um, and I think that because the department has no control over that. It's ultimately a, a court process. Um, I, would, I would ask that the committee reflect on whether that's not a sensible way in which to proceed, to recognise that we wouldn't provide individual numbers for those sorts of things. Yes, and I would like to say it too, because it's not in your destiny. Uh, it's not in your hands. But surely you're, you're able to provide that explanation on paper. Yes. And you don't even have to put a sum on it or a... a, a, a a white band on it, but you can tell us, you know, because obviously this has to go to the Department of Finance at some point, and you will factor it in in your planning, financial planning, some figure. If you could leave that figure out, but, but tell us the reason why you're leaving it out. Okay, that's fine. I mean, we don't factor any of those other significant pressures into our budget, the point being that they are usually of such a scale that we, if we were to be doing that, we would stop doing all sorts of other important things, and we might then look very stupid late in the year when it turned out that the pressure hadn't crystallised, and we then had a big lump of money that we, we could have spent really sensibly, but we didn't. And, yeah. we, and we always make it clear... The difference between the information going to the Department of Finance and the information going to the Committee of Justice, okay. uh, the Scrutiny Committee, and that's the issue. So if, it's, if, if we can find it somewhere else... And that poses a certain question as to where, what is this then? What is this money? Uh, and it comes back to you, oh, Militator. Uh, so I think we'll need some. I think I, I put a lot of store on the new template version that the, the RAIS team has pushed out. It gives us consistency right across, and it's probably the reason why we found it. But, so that's a good thing. But I think we might need to have some sort of template version between the Department of Finance and, or sorry, Department of Justice and the Justice Committee in order that we can have these explanations, okay. even when it's sensitive information. And so even if it is, you know, in closed session or whatever, so be it. But I think we need something uh, by way of explanation because if we find money somewhere else coming from the department, we'll want to know what it is and what it's about. So obviously this is about just building a way of working between the department and the committee and uh, we need to work that through. Um, the templates that have been requested, the very detailed templates, I think do risk um, you know, there being so much detail that it's quite hard to identify uh, the, 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 detail, the, the specific issues. Um, and we ought to try to aim, I think, to get to a place where you have confidence that we will be sharing with you all the issues that are material. Um, including some of the assumptions or risks that go with that, uh, rather than providing uh, huge amounts of uh, uh, information and tables and so on, which are very hard then to understand and to, and to make sense of.
But look, that's a process that we'll work through in the coming months with you and try to get to that place. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, Sinead, I'm not sure if you have anything. Sinead's not there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Um, th there's quite a lot of other questions, Peter. Hello? But oh, sorry, Sinead, you're you're in. Chair, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, Sinead, yes. Okay, you're struggling. I'm that I have just a few points. I'll try and make them quickly. Um, the first one, Deborah, you mentioned about interim payments, and I, I'm just curious to know. I couldn't really hear, so apologies. Those interim payments you mentioned. Are they including the legal aid large case exceptionality, or is that a separate thing? And if so, if we could have an update on that. Um, the second thing, uh, just to get an idea, you know, you reference about trying to find easements within the, the departmental budget to match um, easements that have been made, and it would be helpful to, to, I suppose, walk that path and get an idea of where you're looking within the budget to find those easements. Um, thirdly, the third sector you referred to um, that offer services to the prison service, etc. I presume that's on a contractual basis, and I just want to know what work, if any, has been done to give assurances to those third sectors that you know that those contracts can be honoured, reviewed, and, and really that they're fit for purpose in, in the new world that we find ourselves in. Um, so that they can plan and you know and, and look at working with you. And fourth, it's a point rather than a question. Deborah, you mentioned also that some small capital projects may go ahead, and I would just be keen to get an assurance that in the event of any of those relating to a state project or bill project, that they are reviewed, that they're fit for purpose for this new world that we um, that our spaces are built with the possibility of pandemic. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. I'll try and respond to those four questions, perhaps in reverse order. So uh, we absolutely will be looking uh, very closely at our capital budget this year um, because um, you know, there are two factors here. One, the, um, the, the pandemic may uh, result in uh, some slippage in terms of how quickly, uh, for example, contractors uh, can get on the ground. Secondly, there may be some additional costs when they are on the ground because of things that have changed in terms of the way they need to work to meet social distancing rules and, and so on. So um, we will need to keep that under close review. Secondly, uh, you raised a question about um, the third sector and contracts with the third sector. So um, you know, what we sought to do was to provide some certainty to those that we uh, engage with and, and receive services from uh, that you know, our plan is to continue to receive services from them in the future. Of course, there will be detailed conversations with each of them about how that can be done uh, and how, how that can be done safely uh, in, in whatever the, taking account of whatever the guidance is at that time. Thirdly, you raised the question of easements. So what we've been looking at it are initially those areas where uh, business uh, is likely to be lower as a result of um, the pandemic. And as Deborah explained, legal aid and compensation are the two main areas that we've identified so far. Uh, but we are continuing to look at whether there are any other easements elsewhere. Finally, you asked about interim payments and whether they covered uh, exceptionality cases. So. Uh, I think there's nothing that would prevent uh, those who are working on those cases uh, from bidding for interim payments where uh, they meet the criteria. But just to be clear, when we have previously had separate lines for uh, exceptionality for very large cases, um, that is something that uh, we continue to manage separately from the interim payment scheme. So. Um, uh, that's the kind of distinction. Um, so there's a major case being run in a, uh, a customs and excise fraud um, where I think there are 36 defendants um, and because of the legal representation, the cost for that case could be very significant. We don't yet know when those costs will need to be paid out, but we are keeping a very close eye on that case and that's not specifically covered in the interim payment scheme. Okay, Sinead.
Okay. <laughs> I, th I think it is. Um, <coughs> there's other questions, P Peter, but we'll follow that up in writing um, that, that we wanted to cover in terms of some more of the specific detail, but I'm happy that the committee um, would uh, write to the department. Um, I had looked for the minister's response in the correspondence section of the, the report. It wasn't there. It was actually in this part of the section. So um, we, will, we will deal with that, but I don't want to deal with that with you because ultimately the minister sent the letter as opposed to you, um, and her response uh, obviously is here. And I suspect you provided advice to the second letter, but I'll not ask you to comment in respect of what's in the second letter. The response is the first uh, time you asked, uh, Chair. Okay, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deborah, you're happy to stay. Um, I think we're going to take Thanks. you on into the, <laughs> might be a stretch, is it? <laughs> into the for, for, for the next section. Um, members, ju just to wrap up in, in terms of the, the correspondence from the, the Minister, um, it was in this part of the meeting um, that we had included it in the agenda. Um, again, I'm not going to unnecessarily protract the committee taking a view on this issue. Um, uh, the second paragraph. Unfortunately, the minister continues to disagree with what the committee has said, um, and, and that's her position. Um, but uh, wants to move on from her perspective, and I, I, don't, I don't want to drag it out um, unnecessarily either. As, as chairman of the committee in the committee role, I suspect there will be follow-up outside of that in terms of the way in which the minister has conducted herself in that role. But I wouldn't want to bring the committee into into that domain. So, if, if members are content. Um, I don't intend to respond officially on, on behalf of the committee in response to that letter, unless members have a contrary view that they wish to express on it. Linda, no, Rachel. Okay. okay well, then we will um, respond. Yeah, just, I, I, I just haven't had a chance to digest that letter yet. I'm sure, it might well give me indigestion, but um, uh, that might be something that. You know, let, let's maybe give us uh, ourselves a week and, and just and just contemplate what's the content. I think that's what I would say in that regard. Okay, Linda. I think the chair's proposal on how we move forward is actually the better one, Paul. To be fair. Yeah. Okay, I'm coming up with the committee's view. Yeah, I. I think the the. Yeah, well, there's issues that are to be raised, but I think from a committee's perspective, Paul, my own view is that um, that that'll, that will take place outside with the official position of the committee. That would be my own view on, in terms of that. I don't think we need to bring the committee in, into that in that extent. All that's missing in our letters and apology. You know, would have been would have been nice if you had decided to do that, but clearly that's not going to happen. But nevertheless, so. I'm, I'm content, Paul, as chair of the committee, to recommend that we, we note the correspondence, and that will be the response, and then, uh, outside of that, we'll take our own view. Yep. Yeah, I'll be enough, chair. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, members, moving on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to write... There was a very good report that Cathy has prepared, um, excellent in terms of what it highlights around things to, to question the department on around budget. We'll write to the, the department asking for that. Based on the response, the committee can decide if it's necessary to have a further oral briefing before the June monitoring, if, if you're content. That's how we'll, we'll proceed, and we'll move on to the, the next item. OK, item five. The, uh, COVID-19 response and recovery plan, pages 55 to 59. Um, can I welcome uh, Glenn Capper, Acting Director of Access to Justice uh, within the Department of Justice, Stephen Martin, Deputy Director of the Department uh, COVID-19 Operations Centre to the meeting. And uh, Deborah, I'm going to uh, ask you to thank you for providing an update first. Okay, um, so thank you, Chair, um, and I welcome the opportunity to provide the committee with um, an update on where we are on our response to COVID-19 and specifically around our recovery planning. Um, and I would just like to first of all pay tribute and to thank all of our staff across the department who have continued to deliver our vital services and our business during this crisis under very difficult circumstances. I have to admire the professionalism and the dedication of all of our staff. Our staff have very quickly adapted to these new ways of working. 
working from home without the normal support of the office environment and the benefit of working within our teams. Colleagues have done all that they can to keep in touch and to support each other, but it cannot replace the benefit of the, of the face-to-face contact and the support that we can get from each other. And I don't think that we should underestimate the challenges of the current environment where our staff are working from home while also providing support to their own families, providing daycare and homeschooling, and also managing their own concerns about the current crisis and how that will impact on them and their families, and also quite a number of our staff who are also shielding and in that vulnerable group. They have all continued to deliver for the justice system, and it is testament to their resilience and the good business continuity planning that we have now continued to deliver throughout this crisis. When the Minister was here um, on the 30th of April, she outlined in some detail how the Department had responded to COVID-19, and she also referenced the early work on the recovery planning, and she offered a briefing from her officials as that work developed. Last week, the Committee heard about the response and the recovery work from our two biggest agencies, the Northern Ireland Prison Service and the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. Our intention today is to provide the Committee with a broader context of the Department's developing work on recovery. I hope that you find the written briefing helpful. And we hope in our opening mark to cover two issues. Stephen Martin is leading the recovery planning within the Department, and he will focus particularly on the people aspect of our rolling recovery plan. And Glyn Capper will then hone in on the work that he is leading on the recovery across the criminal justice system. So I would like to pass across to Stephen at this stage. Okay. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Chair, for, for, for inviting us today. Um, at this early stage, our recovery, uh, the key focus is on keeping those staff who are physically in the workplace safe and preparing the, uh, the workplace for the return of more staff when the time is right. Um, the first of the three key, three key themes in our recovery plan is people, and health and safety is a very significant part of this. Um, earlier this week, we published clear guidance for our staff on working safely during COVID-19, and this covers uh, a whole range of issues such as new working arrangements, ways to move safely around our buildings, and protecting our well-being, as well as those core issues of regular hand washing, respiratory health, uh, and, and social distancing. Most business areas uh, across the department are currently conducting risk assessments of all our premises to identify any additional measures that need to be taken to keep returning staff safe. Um, importantly, these risk assessments will be consulted upon with trade union representatives, and I've already had two meetings with, with colleagues from NIPSA, uh, and other meetings are happening across the department. Given the need for social distancing, it is likely that the use of rotas and some level of remote working will be required for months to come. Good communication remains vitally important, and as part of our response, Deborah has established two regular forums that have played a key role both in our response to COVID-19 and in our recovery planning. The first is a meeting with our agencies and larger arm's length bodies such as PSNI and probation. Uh, the Public Prosecution Service also joins that regular call. The second is a business continuity managers forum, which brings together uh, the business continuity leads from each directorate and agency within the department. And these two meetings have played a really important role in identifying issues early and finding resolutions. On recovery, they are also providing a way to, to share good practice and lessons learned. Communication with our staff is vitally important, and we have invested considerable time in identifying issues of concern and addressing them in weekly messages from the Permanent Secretary, which complement our, our wider range of communication activity. And as I said earlier, regular communication with trade union colleagues is a key feature of our work. Um, Glenn's going to, to round off our, our opening remarks with uh, some comments on the wider recovery of the, the criminal justice system. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, morning, folks. Uh, as you know, each organisation that makes up the justice system uh, has implemented and continues to implement a range of measures in response to the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, decisions taken in one area of the justice system impact on other organisations, and as a result, on the overall performance of the system and the experience of defendants, victims, witnesses and staff. So it's important that the system recovers in a coordinated way, uh, taking into account the resilience of each organisation, uh, but also retaining the benefits of new practices that we've implemented. 
To help facilitate this, the Department is leading a project to develop and deliver a coordinated approach to recovering the justice system. There are a number of work streams underway, uh, including exploring alternative options to deal with cases. So, for example, following work across a range of justice bodies over the past few weeks, uh, PS and I have begun using telephone statements instead of written statements, and we're introducing new ways of sharing digital evidence. We're also currently mapping out the stages and timelines for the system to recover on a phased basis, um, recognising, for example, the capacity of each organisation. Uh, and as Deborah's just mentioned, uh, the Chief Executive of the Courts and Tribunal Service was with you last week, setting out some of the issues of plans in courts. We've also captured and we continue to capture positive new ways of working uh, so that we can understand their impact and agree how they can continue to be deployed. <coughs> And very importantly, we need to ensure that defendants, victims and witnesses and other stakeholders are updated. Uh, to do that, we've been engaging regularly with, for example, Victim Support, the Bar Council, Law Society and Criminal Justice Inspection. All of this work is overseen by the Criminal Justice Board, um, chaired by the Justice Minister and including the Lord Chief Justice, the Chief Constable, the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Permanent Secretary of the Department. The board's been meeting fortnightly uh, to discuss recovery, and beneath that, there's a series of working groups taking forward uh, various initiatives. So, in summary, uh, I hope what we've said has given you an insight into recovery plans, both for the department and the wider criminal justice system. Uh, and of course, we're happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, thank you um, for taking us through that by way of the update. The, the COVID-19 risk assessment um, that was carried out um, in terms of the significant changes, you think <coughs> even mentioned some of the, the rota type based system and so on. Can you just give me a little bit more detail of, of the findings of the risk assessment and, and what that workplace environment is going to look like um, going forward? Yes, so risk assessments are premises specific, Chair. So each of our premises will have an individual risk assessment. Um, the template that we're using is based on that produced by the Health and Safety Executive for Northern Ireland. And we've added some additional features which we think are important around ventilation. Um, so, for example, in, in the building that I work in, we have reduced the number of desks that can be used. So we've done a spatial analysis. Uh, nobody will be sitting closer than two metres to each other. There will be fewer staff in the office on a, on a regular basis. We'll use rota systems um, for that. People will re work remotely. We're replacing physical meetings with video conferencing or, or telephone conferencing. Hand sanitization points are at the entry uh, to each to, to, to that building that, that, that I'm working in. And soap uh, is uh, in the kitchen as well as in the in the um, in the bathroom facilities, but the arrangements will change according to, to each each building. Um, and for, for for example, for some activities in our building, for post opening, gloves will be provided for staff who who open the post. So it's that kind of very practical st uh, stuff. But the arrangements will vary from from building to building. Okay, um, and and obviously that two meter is the current guidance in that respect. Um, and I, I've, I've noted in some of the papers that the the virtual and the courts is about 30% slower. So in terms of efficiency and so on, um, my own experience and others, it, you just can't conduct business as effectively as you can hear um, through, through these current arrangements. But that, that's the nature of it. We clearly don't have the capacity in terms of buildings, you know, to, to accommodate everybody on site. So um, what, what's the engagement with Department of Health around? refining the guidance uh, and, and as the R rate and so on um, hopefully decreases that we can move that is no longer two metres and, and the space has to reduce ultimately it will it'll need to go that way if we're ever going to get back to, to everybody being in their, their place of work and you operate virtually where that makes sense. It's a very good point, Chair. We're obviously working within the executive's um, recovery plan. It's a five-stage plan, and at this stage, it, it is a two-metre uh, social distance. But we we are deliberately working on a rolling basis. So as that public health guidance changes, we'll, we'll adapt our plans. Um, and what uh, we've agreed with our trade union colleagues is that the risk assessments for each building won't be static documents. 
that they'll be reviewed on a regular basis and as things change in terms of guidance or numbers of staff returning to the workplace, we'll revisit those, work, uh, those risk assessments to make sure that staff, visitors, customers continue to be safe. Okay, and the, the broader impact then in terms of the customers, citizens that are interfacing with justice, has there been any data started to be collected as to what, what way this is impacting on people and their experiences? Uh, Chair, we, we've been engaging with our, um, with our colleagues, uh, our statistical colleagues, to, to, to look at ways that we can collect information on our customer experience. I have to say, at this stage, our, our efforts have been very much focused on the workplace and on staff safety. But the next stage, uh, as that work, kind of the first stage of that work comes to an end, we'll start to focus on capturing our customer experience, uh, and I'll be, we'll be relying on our statistics colleagues to, to assist us with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that, that's helpful. Linda? Thank you for the, the presentation. Um, just a, a quick point, and I think you've probably covered some of, of my concerns in, in response to the Chair's questions. But one of the things that I think there does need to be a focus on, and, and it's right throughout the civil service, it's not just, not just your department, and actually right throughout the public sector. Obviously, there are some that cannot work remotely, and I accept that. But those in the lower paid jobs, and they tend to be women, and they tend to have care and responsibilities, I think should be offered, particularly in the, in the forthcoming period where schools are going to work in a very different way, where childcare facilities are not able to, to offer the same kind of services that they were. There needs to be a real eye kept on, on that kind of stuff. We shouldn't have women in low paid jobs or men mm. in low paid but they tend to be mostly women those low paid mm. civil service and public sector jobs who are having to give up their jobs because of child care issues so i think there needs to be a focus on a conversation with them because i do think there needs to be a fair mix many people who i've had this conversation with have said i, I don't think i'd want to work from home all of the time i think i would like a fair mix so i think if if there's a real focus on trying to get a fair mix in, in, that, in that kind of, of stuff because one of the conversations that I had with lower paid public sector workers was our bosses in the high paid positions, who many of whom didn't maybe have care and responsibilities, but some of who did as well, were able to work remotely because all of the things are in place for them to be able to work remotely and we can't. So I think there does need to be a focus, but that's right across the public sector. That's not just for, for your department, but we're talking about justice today, so that's, that's where I'm going to focus. And obviously then support in terms of those within your department who can't work from home, so the PSNI officers, the prison officers, all of those, those type of people who can't work from home. So it, it is about getting ensuring that they're having the, the support that they need, although I do know that obviously the Chief Constable, is, there is a focus there for him and, and what kind of work can be done remotely, and that was there prior to, to COVID actually, about what kind of work could be done differently and remotely and, and te technologically rather than face to face. So maybe, you know, there has been some positives, certainly you wouldn't want to be in this circumstance, but the good things, and you've already outlined that, the good learning, the good practice that we, we've learned out of this emergency should be carried through and should be brought forward. But in all of that, communication is, is key. So if where there is not front-facing or public-facing communication with, with the public or with the service users, it is important that some type of communication and effective communication is, is kept in place to ensure that whoever the service user is, or the, uh, whether it should be the public or, or anybody else, that, that they're, they're getting the right communication. So it, it's not an easy task, I know, trying to get all of that balanced, but I do think it's really, really important. So it's important working with the unions, but it's important also that staff have some say in that, you know, and, and the unions is one element and a really, really important element of that. But staff themselves, individuals, should have a way, you know, of being able to go and say, here's what would work for me and is workable. So th there shouldn't be unreasonable requests, but I think that, that staff very often have very good suggestions and they should have a, a method of having an input into, into the, how things work themselves out. And 
we have really tried to do that. We've been encouraging line managers to have the individual conversations with people to see what would work for them. And you know, we were able to respond very quickly when the crisis hit in getting as many laptops as possible out to people to enable them to, to work from home. But absolutely, there's a challenge for those individuals, as I said in my opening, for who are also working from home, but also doing their childcare and the homeschooling, etc. And that does present challenges for people. And whilst that can might be able to be sustained for a short period of time, we have to under uh, we need to be mindful of the impact that is having on our staff who are still at home. So when the messaging changes and when we are able to start to bring people back into the workplace, we will be focusing on those who have been unable to work from home. But we also need to find solutions for those who still have the, the caring responsibilities. Um, and we have those issues are very live to us. Um, and we've been engaging with Next HR um, and trying to push some of the policies as well to see how, what we can do to help our staff. Okay, can I just add one point in terms of staff ideas? I mean, I, I chair the department's internal communications forum and we've been meeting weekly, virtually. Uh, and been getting a lot of ideas through that forum in terms of how things can be done. Um, and next week, our senior team are having a, a, a video conference um, question and answer session with all our staff. So we're very keen. The, obviously, discussions with trade union colleagues is really important, but also getting our staff ideas. And, and we've got those, those couple of mechanisms, and we're doing our best to, to continue that, that conversation. Thank you. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your presentation. I think we welcome the initiative that has been taken and well done to uh, all of those involved. I think the people, we talk about people first, and we certainly you know, should be pushing for it, and we uh, really do recognise the work that has been done, and it is important that you bring your staff with you. And in relation to that, many staff are we talking about? I suppose the non-service staff would be, we're, we're talking about the the civilians in brackets, those that are not working within the service. How many staff are we talking about? I think we have about 85% of our staff are working or working remotely. Um, Stephen might have a few more yeah, so we've, with them. If, if leaving aside um, uniform colleagues in the prison yeah. service, we've, we've just over 2,000 staff. Um, about 40% of those are regularly working remotely. Um, about another third are regularly working on site, um, and I would be one of those. And then we've a number who are uh, about 15% who are, uh, who are on our team rota, so they're, they're not in every day, but they're coming in. Um, and we've very few staff actually who can work remotely, who don't have access to IT. We're down now into the single figures. Um, so there's been a massive deployment from our, our IT colleagues um, who've done an amazing job. Very good. What about those that are off ill, COVID-related illness? Do you, what support is there for those people? Yeah, so uh, in terms of COVID-related illness, um, isn't taken into account for any of the managing attendance procedures, um, and line managers are encouraged to keep in, in touch with, with those staff. We've, we've had um, about, I think it's about eight people who have um, tested positive for COVID, um, which is, is, is a thankfully a very low number. We have about 100 people now out, out on special leave due to COVID. Um, th this is the non-uniformed again. Um, and that is because, mostly because they are having to shield and th their role can't be done remotely. Um, it was nearly 400 at the start of this, and we are down to, to, to about 100 now. Good. Very good. The courts then, the reopening of courts, I know there, there are some courts sitting in a limited way. And the family courts is an issue that comes up you know, from constituents we get. What, what are any plans there to, to move forward on that? And I appreciate it is difficult and there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into account, but have we put any thought into that at all? Uh, if I maybe pick that one up. Um, and I know uh, Peter Rooney from the Court Service was, was with you last week uh, and maybe went into some more detail. Uh, but just to give you an update in relation to the family business, um, Judicial-led review, judicial reviews are underway of uh, family care centre cases um, listed for the, the week commencing the 8th of June. Um, part of that process um, is encouraging parties to, to lodge reports and documentations electronically um, and trying to reduce the resilience on, or, or sorry, the reliance on hard copy files. Um, and also, uh, pilot family proceeding courts uh, are intended uh, in Lisburn and Ards. Uh, and that's going to allow us to test capacity uh, to manage full family court lists 
and that's going to be through a blend of uh, judicial direction and virtual hearings. So I suppose like the rest of court business, um, we're working through how we can reinstate business and we're at those early pilot stages and hoping to ramp business up. Okay, so the impact, I suppose, of COVID on the family courts is quite significant and uh, the efficiency of the court system in relation to that, I suppose, is difficult to measure, but it, it, it obviously is slower and takes a lot longer. It does, and I suppose, uh, as been mentioned already this morning, virtual business, I think, takes, uh, takes longer, um, and you need more breaks, for example. Uh, but a, a big part of getting court business up and running, uh, it, it, I suppose, relies on, on staff and other stakeholders being physically there. Having said that, there's a lot of work going on at the minute. Um, the court service uh, is currently reviewing its whole courtroom estate, um, and through specialist, specialist advice, uh, mapping out and working how different court facilities could be used in a socially distanced way. So that works on the way at the minute, and we hope to get a report on that uh, shortly. Good. You mentioned just chair. You mentioned about telephone statements. I assume they are recorded. Telephone statements. Or am I wrong? Um, I don't have the total detail on that, but yes, those will be recorded statements to allow people to make statements rather than physically turning up and, and making a written statement. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Dig. Chair, thank you. Um, th thank you for that presentation. I mean, you know, it, it's difficult. You know, going into the regime we are with COVID is uncharted waters. But coming out of it is exactly the same. So something you're saying today um, may change in a week's time or two weeks' time, and I'll not hold you to to, to any of this um, because things change, and, and I, ac I accept that. But I thank you for the information that you give. I am a little bit concerned, Stephen, if I can be honest with you, um, that we use the term uniformed and non-uniformed, um, because the reality is you have 3,200 staff in the Department for Justice are all under the same civil service rules and rulebook. So I, I wouldn't be keen that we do that because the reality is here a third of your workforce um, uh, are under immense stress, um, and, and we can't say they're the uniformed ones. But for the non-uniformed ones, here's what we're going to do. Because here's the fundamental problem that I that I have, and, and you've said this yourself, is that people, the impact of COVID on people is going to be long term. People may come back to work, but as they come back to work, anxiety and stress will affect them long term. So the question is, if a prison officer or anybody else comes back to work and within months develops anxiety and develops stress, will they be open to the same rules that gives them warnings or deals with the um, sickness absence under the Northern Ireland Civil Service? Or is there a blanket that if, if, if there is a uh, a, a, a link to COVID-19 that that will not be the case in the future. Um, I mean, I'm I'm no expert on the on the prison service. Most of my work is focused on the on on the non-prison service part of the department, so I can't really comment in detail. But, but I you, guess that's uh, that's for everybody. If I, I mean, if I'm saying yes. three thousand two hundred, I'm saying you know, if 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 I'm a typist and I'm being very and I come back and and being back and there's I have anxiety and stress because I'm back in this environment that I'm working in and I go sick because of the anxiety which is based out of COVID-19. Will I fall under the absence management of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and be open to receiving a written warning due to my absence? Um, I, I mean, I think any reason for absence is, is always taken on the basis of the of the managing attendance policy that's that's there in the civil service. And as line managers, we have a certain amount of discretion to respond to individual circumstances um, and use the support services and so on that are available. So. When, when, when somebody does come back, if there are particular circumstances, you have a discussion with them. If you're unsure, we've got routes into our HR colleagues for more specialist um, information. But we always apply, or, or any good manager will always apply the, um, the policy uh, in a way that's appropriate to the individual that's, that's before them. Um, trying to maintain consistency, obviously. Um, and it's always a, a very difficult balancing act because ultimately, it, you know, if somebody's not in the workplace, it's a you know there's, there's a cost to the public purse for that so it's you're trying to balance a whole lot of things but yes i mean any good manager will always try and uh, apply the policy in, in, a, in a flexible way um, related to the individual circumstances before them so so it's, so it's important that the department for justice and the minister engage with the department for finance uh, who controls the 
um, Northern Ireland Civil Service human resource to, 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 to get that point across? Yes, and we, we do have those discussions. So we're, we're, as Deborah alluded to, we're discussing with HR colleagues on a regular basis. In fact, the, one of the meetings I mentioned earlier, the business continuity managers, um, a senior HR business partner from the Department of Finance sits as part of that group. So we're having dialogue about, about how the policy perhaps needs to flex in particular circumstances and so on. Um, I mean, these are uncharted waters for us, for us all. So to some extent, we're, we're feeling our way through this, and it's really important that we have those lines of communication open with our HR policy colleagues. Uh, and you said something really important there, um, Stephen, and, and you need to have that flex to, to, to change as the circumstances change. Yet your minister wrote back to me and said, we have got no plans to engage with the Department of Finance in relation to sick absence policy. So while you're telling me one thing, that there needs to be a degree of flex, I'm getting a, a, an answer from the minister that says, no way, no reason to engage in regards to the prison service in regards to sick absence. And that concerns me. And it goes back to this point, is, is it because they're uniformed? and the rest are not? Or is it a single workforce of civil servants under the Department of Justice and a single minister? Uh, and that concerns me, Stephen. You don't have to answer that. I'm just making that point. But, but can I ask, though, because people do have to return eventually to the workplace. Uh, when they return to the workplace, having had a long time off, some of them, for, for very good reasons, and some of them shielding, and some of them just can't come back because they're remote working, but will they all receive a back-to-work interview when they come back? And is there a set work induction programme for staff returning to work because Linda said something really important and, and you've said this also is communication. Communication, communication, communication. I've got it underlined three times. I've got it at a start here. It's really, really important. But the reality is when the person comes back to work, is there an induction programme for that person to say, here is the new regime you're working to? Um, what's happening at the minute is that we're currently keeping in, in contact with, with our staff Anyway, um, so I know in the division that I, I normally lead, um, the colleague who's acting for me is having weekly teleconferences with all of the staff, and that's happening right across the department. So it's not a question of we're not in touch with people, we're in touch with people on a really, really regular basis, um, and obviously we'll be talking to them as they come back as well. Okay, fair well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Doug. Rachel? Thank you, um, and thank you for your presentation today. A number of my questions have already been asked, so I'll not to keep you too long. I just have two questions. One coming on for, off the back of um, Doug's questions about mental health, and I know that um, that has been addressed there. But in terms of, um, you'd mentioned about support services that are already available to line managers. If you could outline what support services there are for staff um, across the DOJ, and in terms of uh, if, it, if it's the same sort of support services that are available for arm's length bodies as well, or would they have their own support services there and would you be looking to increase the availability um, of support services for people as we get out of this I suppose so there are there are a number um, of vehicles that we have um, for staff you know there is inspire and you know we have our staff support services etc and we have there's been a, I think it was the week before last there was a, a mental health week and we did issue out some guidance out to staff and encourage them to use that um, the point around mental health is, is really important and we're very alive to it and we know that um, when you're working from home and a little bit isolated, you know, that there are different issues here and things we maybe have never encountered before. So as Stephen says, the importance of the regular contact with staff is, is very important. Um, the regular engagement is another aspect of it and also the regular communications. So um, Peter will normally write you know, every week or every other week to make sure that people pe are, are being kept up to date. And mental health is a feature within those correspondence as well. And encouraging line managers to make sure that they're talking to their staff all the time. Um, and back to Linda's point is, you know, those staff here at home and aren't even able to work from home, when we can, we will try and bring them back into the workplace as quickly as possible and provide them with the support once they're back in that environment. Um, and we have forums within the department as well. We have a staff engagement forum as well, which we will use. And as Stephen says, the internal comms forum, which gives us the regular feedback about how people are feeling and what we can do. Um, the event next week, which is with the senior team, you know, we'll, we're going on WebEx um, and, and staff can ask us questions. I think um, we know that a lot of this stuff will come up as well. And it's back to listen to what people are saying and listening to the ideas that they have and how we can then try and address them and help them back into the workplace and to support them while they're still from home. So there, that we do have a suite of things and we have issued some guidance on that. And we're happy to share what we have given to staff to date, if you find that helpful. 
Yeah, that would be very handy and just out of out of interest. Um, I know that there's lots of conversations happening, sort of society-wide, just about the you know what, the unknown impacts that COVID are going to have. So, I would foresee that this is going to be an ongoing issue for some years. So, we just hope that there would be consideration given to the civil service staff, which we're talking about today, across the board, that actually the access to mental health services and whatever other services actually increases rather than being sort of signed down, and that funding is ring fenced for that, um, because this is going to be an ongoing issue. Um, in terms of staff, if they are being brought back into to work and returning to work, in terms of you know within premises, and if they're uncomfortable with some of the say of the risk assessment terms and identify something that they do, is there a mechanism there for them to report it on in a manner which maybe they feel safe and secure in doing so, and maybe don't feel like their job is at risk? Because I know from different sectors of society throughout this, there had been people reporting that they felt they couldn't report issues on so just if there is issues identified what is the processes for staff to be able to identify that with say line managers or people above yeah i mean the first step will be with their line manager um and they can all also if they're in the, in the trade union they can raise it through their trade union representative but really importantly there's a there's um, a provision in health and safety law that if somebody um feels unsafe justifiably feels unsafe in the workplace that they're you know that they they can refuse their labour and and their kind of safeguards and so on there. So, um, but I don't think it will need to come to that because we have those other channels available. Thank you. Okay, um, Paul or Sinead? No, I'm Hello, right. Chair. Sorry, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just following up um, on that point, um, it's, I really do appreciate what's recorded here, but I. I, I do think we've come to a point in time where there should be a standardisation across um, all civil service jobs. So there's a very clear understanding of what is reasonable and could be expected, but also that employees feel empowered um, to speak up. And you're absolutely right. There are people who are fearful in this new climate of losing their job, and they're very, very reluctant to step forward. Is there an anonymous route that they can take um, to raise a concern? Thank you, Chair. And apologies for earlier, I was talking to you all, but You're thank okay. you. You're okay. The, the question around an anonymous way to raise issues on this? No. I mean, no sorry, Deborah. Do you you go ahead. <laughs> um, we haven't got one because we, we, we feel we've genuinely got really good open communication in um, in the department. I mean, there was an issue, for example, last week with a member of court service staff who had a concern um, and they went to the health and safety executive and, and we, we, we dealt with it that way. So that's always also a route open. But I mean, I think what the health and safety executive said to us afterwards is that we, we've got really good open channels of communication and ways of dealing with this. And it was sort of, we were a bit disappointed that, that the individual felt they had to go that way. So part of it is just reminding people of, of the routes that we do have. Um, but there's al always that route to the health and safety executive, and we're speaking to them on a, on a fairly regular basis as well. Okay, Sinead, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, yeah I just think that it, you know, it is uncharted waters now, and people are uh, perhaps more than ever very, very anxious. And it might be worth, in these circumstances, considering that even on a temporary basis, you know, if you don't want to, but you know, there is an anonymous route, it's just something I think is worthy of consideration. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, it, is, it is a broader point that members have touched on about that consistency, and, and I know that applies across the civil service, and in some environments, that's very challenging. To, and so it's, it's having that flexibility and, and being able to outline why prison officers, for example, a two-metre distancing rule, how is that ever going to work? In the same way in schools, that's never going to work. So w w what I do get from people is they are getting two metres, they're getting all of the, the kind of protections in place, I'm not, and that creates its own tension you know, in, a, in any organisation, and you get that with the, the private sector too. So it, it's just being, and I know you are aware of that, um, and, and you have to do as best you can for everyone in, the, in their own circumstances, but how, how does the policy reflect as you develop it the fact that in some of these environments, two metre social distancing just isn't possible. Chair, so in that case, then we look at how to mitigate the risk. 
So, for example, in our reception areas, that we're conscious that two metre distance isn't necessarily always easy. So we're putting up perspex screens, for example. Um, drivers um, in, in, in certain parts of the organisation who perhaps have to drive, you know, there are two of them for, for short journeys, they might be provided with personal protective equipment. So it, it's looking at alternative ways of mitigating that, that risk for those individuals who have to be to fulfil their role in, in closer quarters for, for a longer period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, unless anyone else has any other questions, then um, can I thank Endeavour and Stephen for being here? Good to see some old faces isn't the right way to phrase it. These are all very <laughs> young looking. <laughs> Good to see you again. Familiar. <laughs> Familiar, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, well, that, that was helpful, and I think it would be useful. The committee could request um, a copy of the department's recovery plan once it's available, as they as, as they complete that work. So, if you're content, members, we'll we'll ask for that recovery plan. Chair, just on that, the course thing, I think it's important as we move forward how that is going to develop, and we got a we got some basis today, but it was rather basic. I think we'd like further information on, on what has been done within the courtrooms and the buildings, etc., and, and the whole process of what has been done in relation to that to get a, a measured return to work. Well, in, in writing to the department, we'll ask that we'll, we want to see a breakdown across their, their remit, exactly how they're going to do it, including what you've outlined around the court service. So we'll, we'll do that. Thanks, Chair. Okay, item six, um, air traffic management and unmanned uh, aircraft bill, the draft committee report. Um, members, it's there for us to go through. Um, the draft report, it was numbered incorrectly. Um, a revised report with the corrected paragraph numbers has therefore been circulated in your tabled pack, and that's at pages 18 to 24, and there's been no other changes that have been made to the report. Um, so if members are content then, I'll refer to the paragraph numbers that are in the report that has been tabled, as opposed to what was <coughs> circulated earlier in the week. Um, any typographical or formatting errors in the report will be amended at the proofing stage before we circulate to MLAs and publish on the committee. So unless there's proposed amendments to the report, then I'll go through the, the formal part of this. Um, Members are content that the title page, contents page, and committee membership and powers page stand part of the report. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Members content that the background section at paragraphs one to four stand part of the report. Agreed. Okay. And uh, members are content that paragraphs five to seven, which outline the purpose of the legislative consent motion, stand part of the report. Agreed. Agreed. And members content that paragraphs 8 to 11 that detail the committee's consideration of the legislative consent motion stand part of the report. Agreed. Agreed. And if members are content that the conclusion section at paragraph 12 stand part of the report. Agreed. Agreed. And members content that the appendices stand part of the report. Agreed. And if members are content that I'll clear the draft minutes of this meeting to include an appendix two, and that will allow the report to be finalised, then the draft minutes will be replaced by the final version of the minutes, uh, which are agreed then by the committee. So if members are content that I would do that. Agreed. Agreed. If members uh, are content for the report to be published on the committee's web page and issued to all MLAs. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And um, members' committee staff will notify members when the date for debate on the LCM has been scheduled. I think it might be next Tuesday, actually. Um, oh, it's Birmingham. Yeah. Sorry. Was that many of them? <laughs> okay. Uh, item 7, then, is the LCM on the Domestic Abuse Bill, pages uh, 69 to 86. At our meeting on the 30th of April, the committee considered a written briefing paper on the proposed LCM on the UK Domestic Abuse Bill and agreed that an oral briefing wasn't required. Members did, however, request confirmation that the LCM would not interfere or delay in any way the progress of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill that is going through the Assembly. The Department has confirmed that the LCM will have no impact on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. And the L LCM was laid by the Department of Justice on the 26th of May under the relevant standing order. And the Committee has now up to 15 days to complete its report. 
Um, so it's just to get members' view if you're content uh, with the proposal to extend provisions of domestic abuse bill that relate to the extending the power of the courts in Northern Ireland to try in the home jurisdiction certain sexual and violent offences which have been committed abroad by way of LCM, or whether any further information or clarification is needed. So members were content. Yes. Okay. Well then, we'll we'll get the appropriate report in due course. Item eight and the Northern Ireland Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme. 14th of May, the committee considered the department's proposal to amend the same household rule within the Northern Ireland Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme 2009. The amendment will allow victims of a crime between the 1st of March 1969 and the 30th of June 1988, living as a member of the same household as their assailant, to apply for <coughs> criminal injuries compensation. And the committee agreed that it was content with the proposed amendment to the scheme. The department has laid the amendment in the assembly on the 29th of May. The Department has confirmed that there has been no change to the policy content since the proposal was considered by the Committee. The amendment of the scheme is subject to approval by the <coughs> Assembly through affirmative resolution uh, procedure. The motion has been included on the order paper for the 9th of June. So, If members are content uh, with the amendment to the scheme, then I will formally put the question to the Committee. Um, that the Committee for Justice considered the draft Northern Ireland Criminal Injuries Compensation Amendment 2020 Scheme 2009 and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, committee Forward Work Programme. Uh, the oral evidence sessions with Women's Aid Federation and the Men's Advisory Project on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill have been confirmed for the meeting on the 11th of June. At our meeting on the 14th of May, the committee considered information on a number of work items that the department wished to progress before summer recess. And given the need to focus on taking evidence on the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill, in June agreed to request further information on the criteria that it was using to assess what it classifies as urgent and essential. The committee also requested a list of the items of business being held back by the department until normal business resumes. The Minister has replied, providing further information on the work items and the rationale for each needing to be progressed before the summer. There are six items, uh, five of which are written briefings and one the department has offered uh, by either oral or written. And to accommodate the department's work items and provide flexibility to consider other issues that are likely to arise during this period, it is proposed that we would hold short meetings to primarily consider writing papers at 1 p.m. on uh, Tuesday, the 9th, 16th, 23rd, and 30th of June. Because members, uh, um, yes, Linda. I'm content that we do the first one and see how it goes, because obviously business is sort of ramping up, even in terms of the chamber, and I'm just a wee bit concerned that we could find ourselves trying to squeeze too much in to a day, particularly a Tuesday when it is a sitting day. And I have to be honest, most days I don't get time for lunch as it is. And that doesn't bother me, but that means that I already have something in that space. So I'm content that we do it, the, the first meeting, but I would like us to be able to have the, op the option to review that, whether that's the best way to go forward. Can I <clears throat> sorry, just confirm going forward, obviously our meetings our Justice Committee meetings were originally to be on a Thursday afternoon. Are they going to be on a Thursday morning going forward? Is that going to revert back to Thursday afternoon? It's tight in terms of <laughs> papers. This week actually was OK, because I was supposed to say that the, the, the amount of papers we had was small would tell you what it can be sometimes, because mm. actually this week was small, and that's, that's a couple hundred pages. But it was nothing in comparison to what we can have. And, and I'm just a wee bit concern going forward. I, I wouldn't rule out that it would be on a Thursday morning, but I would like to be able to plan for that and be able to say, so So here is what, here's the time I'm going to have in which to read my papers, prepare for the meeting and, and you know, speak to the other members of my own party who are on the committee and ensure as a lead that we're all um, able to have a conversation about views on, on the papers prior to the meeting. No, I think I think those those comments are all very fair, Linda. Um, the, the reason why we had been moving this to this morning was because of the ad hoc committee yeah. that would have met every Thursday afternoon, and um, that didn't allow us to broadcast proceedings and had implications in terms of how this biz the committee could conduct its business. Although I note 
the last couple of weeks, the ad hoc committee on COVID-19 hasn't been meeting. Um, and so, you know, if there was clarity going forward, that would allow us to, to hold meetings on a Thursday afternoon, which is my preference um, in terms of, of, of the way we do these meetings on the Thursday. Um, the, the thinking with the Tuesday has been that a number of the meetings, because the sessions have lasted so long, we've galloped through some areas where I would be concerned that we haven't given it a little bit of attention. Um, and my intention for a Tuesday meeting is not for it to be protracted. It is more um, because usually we're here because of the assembly mm -hmm. and to try and get through some of the more routine business rather than rushing through it at the end of, of a meeting. So I didn't envisage those Tuesday meetings lasting longer, to be honest, than half an hour. Um, but I'm quite happy that the first meeting we, we go ahead. The other meetings are provisional to be confirmed if that, uh, if, if yeah. that becomes necessary. Um, but it's just to try and give us a bit more flexibility, knowing that we're going to have the evidence sessions um, on the domestic abuse bill. And I just anticipate those being quite lengthy um, and therefore challenging to deal with some of the other business that the committee has to do. So it's, it's more to build in flexibility. Christine, I'm not sure if you want to comment a bit more on the logistics of these meetings. Yes, certainly. Um, I think just for today's meeting, the papers were less because we held back for items in anticipation that we could deal with them next week. Um, so it does give that flexibility that you're not getting such big packs. Otherwise, the agenda does have 18 or 20 items on it, and the packs then are obviously a lot bigger. Um, in relation to Thursday meetings, we can use um, the Senate Chamber now on a Thursday afternoon if the committee wants. My understanding is it can be broadcast at the same time as the ad hoc committee now. We will double check that, but I'm nearly sure. Um, I suppose the issue just is that we never know when the ad hoc committee is going to meet and we don't know which ministers are making statements. Um, and they seem to be arranged at quite short notice, so we wouldn't know, for example, if the Justice Minister was going to make a statement, we might know until two days before, and we've already organised witnesses for the afternoon. Um, I also understand that CLG met on Tuesday, and we are going to get revised guidance. Um, I don't know whether all you are at the meeting. Um, I think it's going to come out to suggest that committees, rather than taking smaller slots, which was the idea um, over the last number of weeks, that the committees will revert back to getting a morning or an afternoon slot. Um, my understanding is there is a morning slot available for us on Thursday mornings. Um, we obviously could get a, run the meeting in the afternoon if members prefer that. Um, so really, it's whatever suits members best. Um, the only caveat is we go for Thursday afternoons, which probably are unlikely like the ad hoc committee. Um, so it's very close to that meeting. Um, just yeah. in relation to that. I, I'm, I'm content if it's a Thursday morning. It's just as long as I'm able to, to plan. So if, if we say for the foreseeable future until we can sort of know where we're at with the ad hoc committees at being on a Thursday morning, there's no there's no issue for me with that. It's just as long as I know and that I can plan and and ensure that yeah. I'm blocking out a, a, a period of time on, on a on a Tuesday evening or Wednesday in which I can. Yeah. Ensure I give my full attention to the papers. No, I know, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. I would echo those comments. Certainly, um, when I read about the thirty to forty-five minutes on a Tuesday at one, I doubt that that will be long enough to get through. You know, if there's going to be get detail and attention given to a number of items, um, I'm mindful, obviously, of staff pressures as well. And when we would get the papers for the Tuesday. Um, the Tuesday, as Linda said, is an extremely long day, and for members such as parties like myself, where there's only two of you to sh shoulder every single item of business that comes up, yeah. um, another another meeting is fine, but we would need it, it you know, in, in, in good time to get through it. Um, and also with the, the Thursday meetings, I'm more than happy to meet on a Thursday, as long as, again, there's enough time to go through the papers that we do have so that we can give it enough scrutiny that we're all talking about, you know, having the information there to actually scrutinise. So um, in terms of those 30 to 45 minute meetings, that's fine. But is that realistically enough time for what the business is that's on the agenda? Or does it need to be made longer? Yeah. 
Okay. In relation to the papers, um, the intention is to issue the papers for the Tuesday meeting on a Thursday afternoon, assuming we meet on the Thursday morning. Um, if we were to meet on Thursday afternoon, we would try and get them out on Thursday morning. Um, regarding pressures on staff, it has been difficult over the last period of time just with working remotely. In some respects, splitting the pack into two helps because the bigger the pack is, trying to upload it and check it all and prepare all the papers to go out on a Monday um, means we're working much later to try and get that pack out. When it's a slightly shorter pack, it, it actually has eased the pressure on a Monday. It does move the pressure to elsewhere. Um, but I think what we find difficult really is while the, the systems are, are great that have been put in place, um, it really does take much longer to upload all the documents, to check them, and then they have to come to me, I have to upload them, check them, um, and that all takes longer, and the bigger the pack is, the harder it actually is, um, and the longer it takes to do that. In actual fact, the smaller, if we split it into two, it nearly makes it easier from that point of view. Um, so I suppose, in some respects, it swings and roundabouts for us. Um, we either have a very long pack at a very long meeting on Thursday, or we split it. Um, and what we will do is split the staff probably between the two meetings as well, so that not everybody's working on all the meetings. Um, so from that point of view, it's really what suits members best. Um, for next Tuesday, I think we have six or seven items that are all written papers, but um, some of them, I think, just require members to read them. I don't think it will take that long. I think that's why um, the chairman thought it might be helpful rather than adding on time in this meeting and you having to look at those papers for this meeting. Um, so um, I don't know whether it happened or I will take it, <laughs> but um, it's worth, you know, I think maybe if members are content, we'll try it for Tuesday and see. Sure, um, yeah. But I understand you're all under immense pressures for everything else as well. It's just a, sort of appreciate. It's more my concern is more the demands on the staff and whether or not a splitting a meeting would require then additional work at say a weekend, which shouldn't be happening if you're off. You know, so it's just to try and manage that balance and appreciate. You might not want to be as honest as you can. You know, it's, a, um, it's a, the work in balance. But um, you know, we're here to, to to read papers and whether when they're given, that's what we're here to do. So it doesn't matter if we're working to 10, 11 o'clock at night. You know, that's that's our job. So um, just to make sure that you, there's enough flexibility for the staff to be able to to do that and. That you know, I'm more than happy to do Tuesday to see how it goes, and if there's any issues from either end, then we can sure discuss it then. But just to, to make sure that the balance is there. Okay, Chair, you know, I think there is the other issue that we have other commitments and committees, and uh, I know in the economy committee, and there's probably three meetings scheduled for next week, so there is extra workload, uh, you know, and it is difficult to fit everybody in. I think I would prefer the Thursday morning, to be honest, uh, rather than Thursday afternoon. It means you're then finished here, the storm, and you're out and back to the constituency and get you know, Thursday afternoon and Friday then to concentrate on on that work. At well, if you're if you're content, well, we'll go with the yeah the Tuesday the ninth um, and see how how it works. And I'm happy if if it if we move that we say for the rest of June we're going to meet on a Thursday morning. That's okay. And it may be that the, the ad hoc committee then is no longer necessary after recess and, and we can then move back to the normal time frame. But I'm, I'm to, to help members plan, I'm happy to, to suggest that we meet um, for the, the remainder of this uh, month on a Thursday morning and then people can plan their, their own commitments around that, if members are happy with that. Is half ten a time that's appropriate or is yeah. it? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, you, I, can, you. I can do earlier if that's what suits others, but yeah, okay. Okay. Well, listen. At, at least on the Thursdays, that'll let us firm up that date, and we'll see how the Tuesday goes. I'll keep chatting with Christine about the best way to manage all of the staff timing and all of that, and I'm very conscious about the pressures that everyone's under, um, in respect of that too. So, um, okay. If members, in terms of the, uh, the, the departmental paper um, consultation on live links provisions in the Justice Bill, if members are happy in the first instance, we'll get a written briefing and then we can consider if an oral one is necessary whenever we've considered the written paper. Yeah. 
Okay, well, the, the forward work program then will be uh, updated to reflect the decisions um, made today. Um, Tuesday the night's the only firm one. The other ones will be provisional to be confirmed. But, and if it, but, works, if it works, you know, I have no issue. Okay, okay correspondence. Um, there's three items of correspondence. Item 1 uh, that I'll draw attention to is just a response from the Department uh, providing further information on the Outcome 7 Respect Index Indicator, advising that the Executive Office is reviewing the approach to the 2020-21 programme for Government in the current COVID-19 circumstances, and the Department will provide further details regarding timescale for this in due course. If members are content, then we'll note the other information and action correspondence as outlined in the memo. Content. Yeah. I have no chairman's business. Any other business? If not, then uh, we'll meet next Tuesday at uh, one o'clock in room thirty. Okay. Thank you. The Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program.